Hello and welcome to the Varsity Tutor Star Core Series. We're a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Science fiction authors dreamed up amazing new worlds and concepts that kind of inspired all of us to dream and think bigger and in many ways start to pre-solve some of the problems of our own future. And we are thrilled to explore that a little bit more today with the Museum of Pop Culture and our friend Jessica Lane is gonna help us examine how science fiction looks at our own future to solve some of those problems or identify them and just how to write science fiction in a really fun way. And with that, before I turn it over to her, I wanna give you guys a couple of instructions. Today is meant to be interactive. If you thought you were just gonna kick back on a Friday afternoon and watch class, that's not what this is all about. Make sure you've got something to write on or at least type on because we wanna create some science fiction stories together. So make sure you're ready to put your own story together with Jessica's help. And also use that chat box to the right of the screen here. Jessica's gonna ask you for a lot of feedback. We wanna know about what stories you're dreaming up, what uh, problems you see in the future that you wanna solve and all those kind of things. So she's gonna ask you a lot of questions, answer them there. Also throughout the class, if you've got any questions about science fiction, about the Museum of Pop Culture or anything related to those things, ask them throughout the class. And in the last 10 minutes, I'll interview Jessica with your questions to get you some answers. So with that, it's my turn to hand it over. I guess I'll say either use the force or live long and prosper, but mostly have a great class. Um, your teacher for today, everyone, Jessica from the Museum of Pop Culture. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for that introduction, Brian. And I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, my name is Jessica Lane. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the manager of museum education at the Museum of Pop Culture in Seattle, Washington. Our museum celebrates all things pop culture. We have exhibits on science fiction, fantasy, video games, music, horror, and more. And today we're gonna to be talking about some of the basics of popular science fiction stories and how they can help us talk about the problems that we face today. And we'll use these tools as building blocks to help us create our own science fiction stories inspired, some of the, inspired by some of the objects you might actually see at our museum if you happen to go there today. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys. So if you don't know the Museum of Pop Culture, we have a very wacky looking building that was designed by Frank Gehry. And the exhibits we're gonna be drawing from in particular today are our Infinite Worlds of Science Fiction Gallery that you can see here, and also our Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame exhibits. So the first thing I wanna know, we're gonna be talking about science fiction today. So I wanna know, what do you all think when I say the word science fiction? What does that mean to you? What do you imagine? Uh, just share a word or two in the chat about what you think of when you hear science fiction, what you might expect to see in a story, or if you're reading a book, what you might think a science fiction book would be about. So yeah, I see some great answers here already. Um, I see spaceships, uh, alien planets. These are all great things that you might see. Aliens, absolutely. These are great things that you might see in a science fiction story. But one of the really cool things about science fiction is that in addition to all these spaceships and rockets, astronauts, I see there, yeah, absolutely. Um, in addition to all of these things, it's actually not as crazy and in the future and wild as you might think it is. They actually all start from our ordinary surroundings today. They're, they're probably gonna have spaceships and cool technology and alien spaceships and planets, but they're really actually based in our world today and the problem Problems that we're facing today. And we're going to prove this by starting out by thinking of a really basic story. So we're going to start this story totally normal in our everyday world today. No spaceships, no aliens, something that might happen today. So I want you all to use your imaginations as we go through this and sort of fill in some of the blanks in our story with your imaginations. So the first thing we're going to think about is where our story might take place. This is the setting for our story. And I'm going to just put up an example image here. I think our story is going to take place in a city. So if we were in just an ordinary everyday city today, 
think about the kinds of things you might expect to see and hear in an ordinary city today. Maybe some of you live in cities. I'm here in Seattle, so I could be imagining what it's like to be here in Seattle, wandering around Pike Place Market, um, thinking about the kinds of things you might see and smell even around you. What might you hear when you're in this environment? These are all things that help us start building a setting in our story. And of course, every story also needs characters. So we're going to focus on just two characters. Most stories are gonna have a lot of different characters, but we're just gonna focus today on our two main characters. That's our main character or hero, and then their opposite, which is gonna be the villain of the story. So we have our setting here in the city, and let's think about who our hero might be. I'm gonna say in our story that our hero is this young scientist. So this scientist is working in a lab in the city. And you can imagine your own name and your own story for who this character might be. Imagine what their lab might look like. Like what, what tools do you think they might use? Maybe they work with other people and those people could be characters in your story as well. But this is an ordinary scientist working in a city lab today. Our story also needs a really big problem. So if our main character is in a lab in a city, they need to face a really big problem. Otherwise, it's just kind of a boring story. So I'm gonna imagine that our main character scientist in his city lab is working on climate change. It's a pretty big problem that we're facing today. So I'm gonna say that he's working on some solutions in his lab for climate change. So we've got a setting, we've got a main character, we've got a big problem that this character is facing, but now every story also needs a conflict. And the way most stories introduce that is a villain or someone who is against your hero. So I'm gonna imagine that our hero, our villain is this person. So if our hero scientist is working on solutions for climate change, this person would be probably the opposite of that. So I'm gonna imagine that this villain might be a factory owner and they make all their money on plastic. So that's one of the biggest contributors to climate change. So they probably don't want our scientists to be successful. So we have a setting, we have a main character, we have a big problem that that character is trying to solve and we have someone who is working against them. These are some of the really basic building blocks for creating a story. This story could absolutely happen today. You could pick up a, a book today written about this exact same scenario, and probably there is a book that exists about that. Um, so now we're gonna talk about how easy it is to actually turn this story into science fiction. So far, it's totally normal. We're going to make three very simple changes that convert this story into a science fiction story. So the first thing I'm gonna do is imagine that our story is now taking place in the future. So in the future, climate change has not been solved and that's had some pretty big consequences for our world. Ice age, now our city environment is covered in snow and ice. Clearly our scientist has not been successful in stopping climate change. So there's one change that already starts changing the way you think about the story. I'm going to make another change. Now I'm going to say that our hero is actually a robot. Still working in a lab, still trying to figure out how to reverse the damage of climate change and address this big problem. But now that totally changes our story too. Still the same story we started with, but it's starting to feel a lot more like a science fiction story. And then we're going to make one more change. And I'm going to take our setting and I'm going to say we're suddenly on an alien planet. So we still have our scientist, still working on climate change, still have our villain who's working on the plastics factory that's going to keep producing pollution and uh, getting us into trouble with climate change. But now we've made three really simple story changes to our story and that changes our story entirely into a science fiction story. So it's really easy to think that you have to start from an alien planet when you're thinking about science fiction, but it actually starts somewhere really, really familiar to us. So this is a great little exercise you can do if, as you're starting to think about story ideas too. So now we're gonna talk about some of the basic building blocks that go into creating science fiction, some of the common elements you're gonna see in these stories. 
The first one is that they are all possible. We absolutely believe that these stories could happen. Just like our climate change scenario, we believe that this could happen. A good sci-fi example of that is Dune, uh, which imagines life on a desert planet where water is a precious resource. Possible, we don't know that that exists today, but it is a possible scenario. The second piece is that they're all set in the future. So they're either gonna be set totally in the future or in some kind of alternate version of our world. A good example of that is the uh, 1995 film Waterworld, which is kind of a terrible film, but a great illustration of climate change and the impacts of, uh, of, of that big problem in the future. And it imagines a world where all of the polar ice caps have melted and the seas have risen and most of the land is now flooded. And then the third component is that they all deal with consequences. So they deal with the consequences of our action or what might happen if we don't take action. And a great example of that is the film Wally. i I'm sure a lot of you have seen Wally. It's also a great story uh, to illustrate some of the basics of science fiction. And it imagines the consequences of excessive trash and the resulting climate change that happens from it. So the best science fiction stories are gonna combine all three of these elements. So they're gonna take something that's possible they're gonna combine that and set it in the future. And then they're gonna imagine the consequences of our actions. So they put all of those pieces together to tell a story. And one simple way they do that is by using a question that starts with what if? And this is a tool you can use in your stories as well. You imagine thinking about our starting story, what if we don't solve climate change? This is a great way to start a lot of science fiction stories. And if you look at a lot of them, you can actually sum up their entire plot just by finding out what their what if question is. So let's look at an example. So what if we continue polluting the earth? We're gonna look at the example of the film Wally. -E. So you take a real world problem, excessive trash in this case, you imagine what that problem could look like in the future. So you see here that there's too much trash and now the earth is covered. And then you imagine the potential consequences of our actions. So part of the consequences of our actions in Wally is that we create this robot that now has to go around and try to clean up all of our, our trash. And the other consequence is that people are now uh, living on a spaceship in the middle of space and are just moving around on these little mobile chairs and not doing much. Um, so this, this is kind of a building block you can use, a structure you can use to, uh, to both analyze stories and also to write your own. And that's the big thing we're gonna be doing today is giving you all the building blocks that you need to write your own science fiction stories. So the first building block we're gonna think about is what your what if question is. So again, like in our real, our story that where we started out, our what if question was, what if we didn't solve climate change? That was the big problem that we were facing. So I want you to think about what big problem your characters in your story might face. And here are a couple of things to keep in mind as you're thinking about this. The problem should be really big. So this should be something that impacts everyone in some way. It shouldn't be you lost your left sock or something like that. It should be a really big problem that's really impacting everyone. It shouldn't be easy to solve. If we don't make changes, this problem is gonna get a lot worse. So think about those kinds of things and type in the chat what you think you might like to use as the question, the big what if question for your story. All right, I see a couple of people are, are liking the idea of, of climate change. They wanna stick with that one. Glaciers melting, that's a great one too, yeah. Um, deserts, yeah. Poverty, that's a great problem, yeah. Racial inequality, excellent. Those are all big issues that we're facing today and they would be fantastic ideas for a science fiction story. There are a lot of different things you can do with those too. And you can keep, keep taking notes and imagining what big problem you might wanna solve with your problem as well. 
So the second building block we're going to look at is our setting. So just like in our starting story, we imagined it in a big city. And the setting is going to tell you a lot about what your story looks like. These are just some example images. You don't have to pick one of these. Um, but we're just going to think about some questions about how we can imagine settings in science fiction stories. One of the tools a lot of sci-fi stories use is utopias and dystopias. And these are really big concepts, but you can think about them as ways to kind of provide color and texture for your story. The setting that you choose can impact what people wear. It can impact what, how they might behave and speak. It might impact how they act in a story. So choosing a setting can actually really tell you a lot about your story. So we're going to look first at what a utopia is. This might be a term that some of you have heard before. Utopias usually look like we've solved our big problem. It appears that way anyway, especially to the characters inside of them. That's an important thing to remember about these ideas is that this is how the world looks if you're a character in this story. They tend to be really clean. They have a lot of green space and modern technology. And usually the characters who are in a utopia tend to look like they have pretty easy lives. Utopias are often a lot more complicated than that because if you just told a story about a perfect world, it wouldn't be a very interesting story. So a lot of times in science fiction stories, you find out that things look perfect, but they actually aren't. So that's a fun thing you can think about as you're doing your own stories. So the opposite of a utopia is a dystopia. Unlike a utopia, a dystopia looks like we have not solved the big what if question. So when you think about our climate change story at the beginning set in the city, when you wake up and the world is frozen, that's definitely a dystopian world where we have not solved our problem. They tend to be dirty, polluted, broken down. So they look and feel a lot different than a utopia. And a lot of the characters in a dystopia really struggle to survive. So now I want to hear what you all think. We're going to look at two different images and I want you all to think about whether these appear to be a utopia or a dystopia and what might make you think that. So here's our first image. Everyone can post in the chat whether you think this is a utopia or a dystopia. See, a lot of people think this is, this is a utopia. Lots of green trees. Yeah, absolutely. It looks pretty nice and comfortable. Yeah. Oh, a couple people are now thinking it might be a, a dystopia. There are no people. That's a great observation. Yeah. Maybe things are more complicated than they seem to be. Utopia. Looks like a utopia, but actually a dystopia. Great observation, yeah. So there could be something a little deeper going on here. All right, let's look at our second image. So what do we think about this one? Do you think this one might be a utopia or a dystopia? What do you observe? I see a lot of people saying dystopia broken down equipment. Someone notices this guy is in a suit uh, down here, maybe some kind of protective suit of some kind. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people think this might be a dystopia. Oh, someone's noticed there are birds and trees up here in the right hand corner. So maybe again, this world's a little more complicated than we think it is. Maybe there's some utopian elements going on here as well. Yeah, these are all great observations. Looks like a broken down train track. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so these are all great observations about utopias and dystopias. And again, these are ways you can think about your own story and ways to sort of color how they look and how they appear. Um, because a utopia is gonna look and feel very different from a dystopia. So as you start putting together your second building block of your setting, what do you think your story appears to be? So remember in a utopia, it's gonna look like we've solved our big problem. In a dystopia, it would look like we haven't. 
Um, so those are going to be two very different stories. You could create two very different stories about the same problem, which is one of the great things about science fiction. Um, so yeah, so I want to hear if you want to post in the chat, see a mix of people. Some people are wanting to do a utopia. Oh, someone says a utopia that it starts as a utopia and then becomes a dystopia. That's, that's a great story right there. Yeah. Awesome. A couple of people wanting to do a dystopia. Yeah, dystopias are really common in science fiction. They're, it, it's, it's pretty fun to experiment around with different dystopian worlds. So you find those probably more often than you do utopias in science fiction. Great, these are all great ideas. I can't wait to hear what your stories look like when they're all put together. All right, so now the third building block, every story needs characters. So we're gonna think about, again, just those two main characters from your story. When you actually write your story, you're probably gonna to wanna to have a lot more characters in there. But for us today, we're just gonna focus on those two main characters and we're gonna draw some inspiration from Mopop itself. So you've imagined your what if question, you've started thinking about what your setting is gonna look like, if it's going to appear to be a utopia or a dystopia. And now it's time to add in your characters. So characters are one of the most important tools in science fiction because they really help bring the story to life. We relate to the characters and their stories. So that really helps us connect and helps the message of the story become more realistic and true to us. So let's think about your story's two main characters, the hero and the villain. So we're gonna think about some basic questions that you can ask as you're building these characters in your own mind. And then we'll look at some examples that are all things that are on display at the Museum of Pop Culture. And you can choose if you'd like to use one of these as an example in your story. It doesn't matter if you know what these are actually from or not. Um, they're just to give you some inspiration. So let's talk first about your hero. So every hero is gonna need a name. You all are welcome to share responses to this in the chat or just take notes yourself. Um, there's no need to post in the chat unless you'd like to share your ideas with everyone. I'd love to see them. Uh, so first you need a good name for your hero. Your hero is also usually going to be the character who's trying to solve your what if problem. So whatever that big question you're facing, your hero is usually the one who's trying to solve it. And the other question you wanna ask is what do they want? So they need a name. You need to understand how they're trying to solve the big what if problem and understand what do they want to accomplish by the end of the story. So now we're going to look at some examples from the chat, uh, from the uh, from the museum. So again, these are all objects or films that we have represented at our museum, and these can all be inspirations for who your hero might be. So if you like one of these and want to use them as your main character, you can share that in the chat. And again, it doesn't matter if you recognize any of these or not. Um, these are just a, sometimes it could help to see an image because that kind of prompts you to think creatively about who these characters might be. So yeah, a couple of people recognizing Uhura here. She's a great character from Star Trek. She'd be a great character in any sci-fi story. Of course, you'd want to put your own creative spin on her as well. Um, Indiana Jones, again, another good example there put your own name and characteristics to them. Awesome. Great ideas, everyone. So now your story is also going to need someone to oppose your hero. So as you start fleshing out your hero more, you're also gonna wanna flesh out your villain. So this, you can ask the same exact questions. You're gonna need that same information about your villain. So as you're thinking about your villain, they're gonna need a name too. Usually the villain is the character who really wants that what if problem to continue. So whatever they're doing, they like it. Whatever the what if problem is, they really want this to continue. So they're fighting against the hero usually. 
and they also want something in your story. So by the end of the story, they want something. It's probably going to be the opposite of what your hero wants, but it's important to understand both of those characters as you're building them in your story. So again, I'm going to put up some example images on the next slide from the Museum of Pop Culture, and you can choose to use these as examples in your story. Um, you don't have to recognize them. You can just use them as a starting point as you're thinking about your characters. So here are some examples of potential villains in your story. A lot of different ways you can think about villains in science fiction. And of course, in science fiction, they don't have to be human either, which is great. <laughs> Oh, see a couple of people like, like the idea of a, a robot. Yeah. The insect guy. Yeah, <laughs> he's pretty fun. That's actually the character Ceres from Galaxy Quest, if you've seen that film. Yeah. Again, you're welcome to, to share some of your ideas in the chat. I see some great names for characters popping up down here. Awesome job. Yeah. These are all great ideas. I'm so excited to see where you take these characters. So now that you've thought about your hero and your villain, your next part is to really just imagine their story because they don't exist on their own. They have a whole story that goes along with your setting and your big what if problem. So now let's imagine how they might function in your story. Your two characters are gonna have to meet at some point. So where do you imagine them meeting for the first time? Again, you can just write down these questions, think about them. You don't have to answer them all today, but these can just be tools you can use as you're building your own story. So imagining that first meeting between your hero and your villain. Um, in our starting story, I imagine that the, the scientist and the plastic manufacturer meet at a conference somewhere and there's, you know, the, the plastic manufacturer confronts the scientist about their, their presentation about climate change um, and feels like it's gonna disrupt the entire economy. Um, so I imagine that as a potential place where your characters might meet, but your story is gonna be totally unique and up to you. You have to imagine why they're in conflict. So they're both working on this, this big problem, this big what if problem that you're talking about in your story but there has to be a reason that they're in conflict. So you can think about that as you're developing these characters. And it's somehow by the end of the story, the conflict has to be resolved. So somehow someone is gonna win at the end of this, the conflict is going to be resolved or continued perhaps in part two of your book series. And then you can imagine which character succeeds. Um, we often like to think that the hero is always the one who's gonna win at the end of the day, but that's not how it always works. Sometimes, especially in science fiction stories, a lot of times the villain is the one who wins at the end. Um, see, I see a couple of people like the idea of the, the villain winning. Yeah, that can be a great scenario for a science fiction story, especially um, your hero doesn't have to win at the end. Um, it can always be a fun twist to throw in there with your plot. All right, so now that you've had a chance to really kind of think through the basics of your story, um, let's test it. You know, we, we learned about these basics of science fiction in the beginning of our session today. So let's test our story. You've thought now about your big what if question. You've got a couple of building blocks. You know that these stories are gonna be about, they're gonna have a setting. They're gonna be dealing with this big problem. You've started thinking about your hero and your villain. And as you're imagining this what if question, you're imagining these future consequences of the, of the actions. So let's test your story against our science fiction basics. So as you're thinking about your story, really making it a true science fiction story, you wanna test, is it possible? Is your big what if question, is that a possible scenario? Have you set up a believable story um, that is something that could possibly happen. And then if you remember our second building block, it's usually gonna be set in the future or some kind of alternate version of our world. So usually as you're imagining that what if question, that's gonna take care of a lot of these questions for you, which is why it's such a great tool to use as you're thinking about the plot for your story. So you wanna think about whether your story is possible. You wanna imagine whether it's set in the future these are kind of the tests you can use on your story. 
And then you also want to imagine how it's dealing with the consequences of our actions or the consequences of our lack of action. Um, so a lot of times that's how you end up with a dystopia that we, uh, we don't do what we're supposed to do. So we end up with this horrible dystopian world. So these are all the building blocks you can use. I'd love to hear some comments in the chat, see some comments. Do, do you feel like your story is meeting all of these criteria so far? Yeah? Yeah, I'm seeing some great ideas of a dystopian climate change world. Yeah, that one's very popular. There are a lot of books being written now that are dealing with climate change. And it's a really great way to start a conversation too. Yeah, these are all fantastic ideas. Yeah, awesome. Income inequality. Yeah, that's another great one. I'm looking forward to hearing about more about that story. Awesome. These are all great ideas. You all have done a really fantastic job thinking through all of these. Great ideas. Yeah. So like I said, you can use all of these basic building blocks. You've got your the three building blocks we've given you, your, your setting, um, your big what if question, your characters. These are all great tools that are pretty simple to use and that you can put together in a lot of different ways to imagine a story. And it doesn't take these big, huge, crazy steps to imagine it as a science fiction story. Again, as we saw in that opening activity that we did, all you really have to do is take a modern story and modern characters and then just put little science fiction twists on them. So you can imagine what that is going to look like in the future. That will totally change your story into a science fiction story. You could imagine like we did in our opening activity that one of our main characters is suddenly a super intelligent robot working in a lab. Um, so you can imagine what that's going to look like as a future version of your story. Um, and you can imagine how we're using these different tools to deal with consequences. So think about utopias and dystopias as you're putting all of this together. These are all little tiny tools that you can use really simply and quickly to imagine a, a future science fiction story. Uh, so it's not as complicated as you might think it is, even though it does have alien planets and spaceships and all kinds of cool technology and things. Um, the tools you can use to create a science fiction story are pretty simple. And I would love to hear more about what you all create. So you all have done a great job today of thinking through some science fiction stories and imagining future scenarios. Um, I've loved seeing all of your comments in the chat to see what ideas you've had. I cannot wait to read some of these. I can tell we've got some budding writers on our hands. Um, so I hope that you are inspired to take those notes that you've started thinking about today and really turn those into your own science fiction stories. Um, these are some pretty simple tools that you'll be able to use a lot. Um, so they come in really handy whether you're writing science fiction or other stories as well. Um, so if you feel like sharing any of your story ideas, you're always welcome to email us at education at mopop.org. Uh, we'd love to see what you come up with. Um, we also are we're revamping right now, but we do have a, a science fiction and fantasy short story competition and comic book competition that you can enter your, your brand new ideas in now that you've got the insider tips. <laughs> Um, we also have a, an extension activity that will give you some other tools that go along with the class. If you'd like to access that, feel free to email us that as well, and we'll be happy to send you a copy of that as well so you can keep working on your ideas. And if you visit us online, you can also learn more about all of our live stream classes. We have virtual student clubs, summer camps, and more, and you can read about all of those on our website. And I just wanna thank you all for joining us today for our class and uh, hope you all have some really great building tools that you can use now for creating your own science fiction stories. Um, I can't wait to see what you will come up with. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks so much, Jessica. That was uh, that was a blast. And um, 
now I have a lot more direction. My, you didn't mention this one. Actually, there's a contest. I don't know if I want to give this one away, but I've been thinking about, you know, another trope is, uh, is, you know, a common theme is uh, the robots taking over. So mine yeah. involves, you know, those Boston Dynamics dog robots that are insane. Um, they take over, but they just keep us as pets. And so um, they're actually the heroes and they just treat us really well. They take us for walks and give us food and uh, treat us like heroes. So that's, um, that's that. mine. <laughs> and um, Jessica mentioned everyone out there. If, uh, if you want to share your stories, I should have mentioned it at the top. Um, you can definitely email to them. We also want to have a contest here. Not want to, we have a contest um, that I'll put the rules up uh, on the way out here for everybody. But if you post your sci-fi story title, and if you want a synopsis as well to, uh, to Twitter or Facebook and tag Varsity Tutors um, and Mopop there, and we'll have all the handles up there so you know exactly who to tag, you'll be entered to win a free spot in Young Animators um, Camp this summer with Varsity Tutors. And so um, if you want to learn more about that, there's a link on your screen. But really what I want to get into now is you guys had some really amazing questions. And so we're going to put uh, Jessica on the, the hot seat right now to uh, to get you guys some answers. Um, I thought one of mine, if we go all the way back in the beginning, I thought was a really good um, question. That was one of my, one of my favorite ones. Um, when well, somebody asked, um, you know, is the Museum of Pop Culture in Seattle, Washington, what is pop culture? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> That's something we, we wrestle with almost on a daily basis at the museum. Uh, but pop culture is short for popular culture. Um, so it really is anything that's popular and loved by people today. Um, so you can tell a lot about what we consider as pop culture from some of the exhibits we have. Um, so right now we have a whole exhibit that's on indie games. So you would definitely consider that popular culture that's very popular um, today. We also have a Pearl Jam exhibit, um, Jimi Hendrix, Nirvana. <laughs> These will all be considered pop culture. Um, we've also had an exhibit on uh, Hello Kitty. Uh, it was a great exhibit. We just closed our Minecraft exhibit. Um, so again, all those are really considered things that are, are popular today. Um, so we sort of consider popular culture is, is generally things that people are really passionate about today, things that you you care about today and that are relevant to you today. So yeah, that's a great question. Excellent, and one, a great explanation of everything that, uh, that's there at Mopop, that's uh, that's really exciting. So lots of fun things to uh, to be able to uh, to come and see. And we'll, we'll make sure we talk a little bit more about what's coming up, um, you know, coming up soon in just a second. Um, Another really common question, probably the most common one, was you were talking about, um, and, and you know, I may have contradicted you even in the intro there about how you know these stories should be um, set in the future and involve consequences. Um, can science fiction take place in the past? I think a lot of us are kind of hearing that a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Um, what are your thoughts on science fiction? Can it take place in the past? You know, that's, that's a hard one. And you, you mentioned the long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, we have a, uh, an ongoing debate in at Mopop about whether Star Wars is science fiction or fantasy. Um, I personally, personally am team fantasy for Star Wars, partially because of that very fact that it does deal with something that happened a long time ago. Um, the other issue you get, you get into with Star Wars is that there's a lot of elements of kind of magic in in Star Wars. So it kind of violates that possible element that we use as a test for science fiction because you know the, the crystal that's in the lightsaber is that's kind of more of a fantastic element. Um, if they'd set that in the future, you could imagine that being like a future ore that we just haven't discovered yet. Um, but setting it in the past and having the force and all of this sometimes we actually struggle with how to include <laughs> Star Wars in our science fiction stories a lot just because of that reason. Um, so you could theoretically come up with a sci-fi story that takes place in the past. A great example of that, I think, is a lot of the, like, like if you're a fan of Doctor Who, um, there are a lot of episodes of Doctor Who where they travel to the past. And so the whole story takes place in the past. So you would still consider that a science fiction story, but it is taking place in the past. Um, part of the issue you run into, I think, in building a story in the past is that you've got to account for all of the sci-fi technology. And if you're setting your story totally in the past, 
how do you account for that technology existing? Um, so that's one of the big elements of science fiction too, is using science and technology to fuel your story. So you've got to come up with some kind of reason for why that exists in the past. But that's why that, um, that you could either set in the future or in an alternate version of our world, you can use that kind of twist on that, that element to use that as a way to think about your story in the past for sure. That's maybe. great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we had other questions too about, you know, difference between sci-fi and, and fantasy. I think you yeah. kind of hit on that a little bit, the fantastical elements and uh, it's not quite, yeah. you know, kind of the pure science and plausibility. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we generally, like if you're thinking about a fiction story, a fantasy story and a science fiction story, the way I tend to kind of break that down is a fiction story is going to be based on the actual it may not be a true story. <laughs> like, you know, you think about something like Hamilton is a great example of something that I would consider a fiction story. It's based on real things, but there's, it, it's not quite real. And so it is an actual story, actually does happen, but is also fiction. So if you imagine then a fantasy story, that's gonna be based on something that's impossible is the rule we usually use. So it's gonna be fairies and castles and castles are real, but <laughs> castles in the sky and <laughs> dragons and invisibility cloaks and things that aren't quite possible. But when you're looking at science fiction, the biggest element of those is that they are all possible. Um, they may not exist yet, but they're usually based on a problem today or they're, they're inspired by technology that we use today. So they're all totally possible. Um, so fiction would be based on the actual, even if it's not actually true. Fantasy would be based on the impossible, and then science fiction is based on the possible. That's a great breakdown. Thank you very much. That's, um, yeah, really, really appreciate that. And um, and that kind of, I guess, maybe leads into another, you know, that, uh, that um, it, it can be based on something that's possible, but a technology that may not exist yet. Um, you want to know, are there any examples that you can think of, of, you know, ways that either science fiction has predicted a technology that, you know, no, no one, have, you know, it wasn't, can, you know, close to possible, but at least showed that it was possible as, as you know, basically has life imitated art. Can you come up with examples where sci-fi has helped to solve a problem or kind of helped push along a technology we might not have gotten if someone in sci-fi hadn't, you know, uh, conceived it or originated it? Oh, so many. Um, Star Trek is a great place to look for inspirations like that. Um, the first flip phone was inspired by the original series Communicators. If you've seen pictures of those, they look exactly like modern flip, flip phones. Uh, the iPad also came from a design from Star Trek The Next Generation. They had a handheld uh, pad. It was a personal access data device. Um, and that was actually, uh, Insider Story was created because they had no budget to actually create something that was high tech. So they needed something that people could carry around and basically just put a sticker on it that made it look like a cool piece of technology, but they didn't actually have the technology to make it really happen. Um, and so that design ended up inspiring the iPad. Um, and you see examples of it going even back into the 60s, like in the, uh, the Jetsons, the old cartoon. Um, I don't know if any of you all remember this, parents maybe might remember this more, but um, they had a, a little uh, robotic uh, vacuum cleaner that ran around and vacuumed for them that you can argue now we have the Roomba. Um, so there are a lot of things where that the, the technology they imagine in science fiction stories actually then goes on to inspire new technology today. Um, and that's one of the great tools for science fiction too because they're looking at modern problems and they're usually basing a lot of their, their technology solutions on what actually exists today. They can also then fuel research that's happening for you know and helping us solve these problems that's one of the best tools they they do is they they really help us create um create a space to have a dialogue about these issues and think outside the box and imagine you know new potential solutions for them um like there are scientists right now who are you know developing artificial trees to help combat uh, climate change um, and a lot of those ideas first appeared in science fiction stories so they're a great way of kind of thinking ahead. Um, you know, like there, there's also a lot of research being done now on uh, how to like for producing food, um, since there are a lot of areas facing food shortages, 
and set in again often in Star Trek I think you'll see you know devices on ships that that help them go on long journeys and have sufficient food um, they're really using that idea as a way of you know imagining basically a 3d printer for food um, which is a pretty cool technology so it's kind of this big cycle <laughs> science fiction starts with what is familiar so that we have a way to relate to it they imagine what that could be in the future but then sometimes that actually inspires the thing in the future <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing that is so cool another one uh it probably is fantasy as much as uh, science fiction but um i grew up on the backs of the future movies and the hoverboard i think came out like last week so um you know it's definitely uh it's pretty you know you think about it it, it makes sense right you get the most creative minds out there tend to be fiction writers sci-fi writers you know people who are just kind of conceiving what could possibly happen and then that inspires those who are a little more technical and methodical to make it happen. So um, it, that's, that's, thank you for that. And then one other thing you said may lead us into our, our last question. You mentioned how, you know, science, science fiction is a, a vehicle to start these dialogues and, uh, and have these discussions. I think that's exactly what the Museum of Pop Culture is as well. And we had a ton of questions about, um, you know, what's, uh, how to visit the you know, Museum of Pop Culture. What if you don't live in Seattle? What is your favorite, uh, you know, exhibit there? What's coming up there? So uh, maybe as a last question, just tell us as a, uh, you know, a, a place to facilitate these uh, necessary fun and, and uh, constructive dialogues. Tell us a little bit more about how we can get more involved with Mopop. Absolutely. Well, if you are coming to Seattle, of course, we'd love to see you in person. The museum is open right now. Um, we do have limited capacity and time ticketing and COVID protocols and everything to keep everyone totally safe. Um, but also through the pandemic, we've developed a lot of really amazing online virtual programs that you can participate in. So we have uh, longer versions of our workshops that you can take and you can read about all of those on our website. Those are available as live stream classes that you can do with a, a group. Um, you can do it in your classroom. The great thing is that those can be available to anyone. You don't have to be here in Seattle. Um, we also have a new virtual student club program that we just started in the fall of last year. Uh, we just wrapped up our second Minecraft club and we'll probably be running another one of those in the fall of 2021. Um, we also just finished a cosplay club, which is a, a great exploration of uh, all the different elements into creating your own cosplay look for your next Comic-Con. Um, and again, those are all virtual programs. So it doesn't matter where you are, you can still join us and take part in Mopop content that way. Um, we also have a number of public programs that are being offered virtually as well. So you can always join in on those. Um, uh, coming up at the museum, so we just closed our Minecraft exhibit, but coming right on its heels, opening on June 5th, is our new Disney Heroes and Villains exhibit. So that's all about costume design. So there are some amazing Disney costumes that are coming in that I am so excited about. We have, I think, three or four Cinderella dresses. Um, there are the original Mary Poppins costume is going to be there, which may possibly make me cry. Um, <laughs> so there are going to be some really amazing, amazing costumes coming in there um, over the summer. Uh, so we're super excited about that. Um, and we do have some summer camps coming up. If any of you all happen to be in the Seattle area, we've got some, some great summer camp programs. You can learn to, to write and film your own music video. Um, we also have a one day virtual workshop on improv comedy that you can take again from anywhere. Um, we'll be designing our own museum in Minecraft in one of our camps as well. We've got some great programs there. Um, and we're also doing a drag camp this summer too for high schoolers. So we're, we're really excited about all of those opportunities. Um, I think somebody asked what my favorite part of the museum was. And I, I am a diehard sci-fi fan, <laughs> if that's not obvious. Um, I fell in love with Star Trek when I was, I don't know, probably in fifth or sixth grade. Um, I went to conventions back in the day when they were still just run by the fans. Um, and it was like a little printed program on a yellow piece of paper. <laughs> um, and so I, I have loved sci-fi since I was very small um, and it is just a love of mine. So I love all of our sci-fi exhibits. Um, I, I did cry when I went into our Star Trek exhibit for the first time, like big crocodile tears. <laughs> Uh, well, um, I, definitely understandable. And thank you so much for, uh, for sharing your knowledge 
of and passion for science fiction with us uh, tonight. This was really incredible. Reminder to everyone, uh, we would love to see um, your uh, your titles and, and maybe a brief synopsis. If you put those on social media, tag Varsity Tutors and uh, Mopop, you'll be entered to win a, a spot in, uh, in our Young Animators Camp coming up this summer. And uh, definitely check out all the exciting things coming up here soon at uh, Mopop as well. So let me, uh, with that, I um, will get those instructions up here for you so you can uh, can tag those accounts. Um, like I said, we uh, will be we'll be scanning social media, you know, long into the night to make sure we've uh, we've read all those stories. So huge thanks there, Jessica. Thanks so much to you and everybody at Mopop for uh, for participating and and participating. Sounds like that's like passive for uh, for being absolute superstars and uh, and helping us create amazing stories. So. Thanks a ton. Thanks to all of you for your great questions and in advance for your story titles. And uh, we hope everybody has a great weekend.